Improved it, Hanson, but I still think it idles too rough. Say, hey, maybe it needs a new carburetor. Check on it and let me know, huh? Right, boss. All right, 12 o'clock. Let's go eat. Come on. Hey, let's go, Coleman. Come on, come on, come on, Coleman. lawyer doesn't spend all his professional life in smoke-filled, oak-paneled director's boardrooms. He goes to his clients, especially when it's hard for them to come to him. Warden Morphy was an old friend. The luncheon was his idea. He had something on his mind, a personal matter, he said. Well, it's, uh, it's not really personal, but I guess you could call it that, Herb. In less than a week, I have to kill a man. Now, that's not the first man I've executed in the ten years I've been warden, but... I'm afraid Ron Davis might be the first innocent man. Ron Davis? He's the kid who murdered the big wheel hoodlum here in prison. Ace Coleman, about 18 months ago, wasn't it? That's what a jury of his peers said he did. Well, do you have any additional information? Added evidence the jury didn't have? Not enough for a new trial. But Herb... You know I've worked and lived with all kinds of criminals for years. I feel I know a little bit about what makes them tick. I watch this boy, Davis. I can't believe he's guilty. Oh, look, Paul, Ron Davis's father is one of the wealthiest men in the state. I've heard that he's, he's spent several fortunes in the boy's defense. Herb, I know you've taken many cases on no more than a feeling, a hunch that the party was innocent. They've exhausted every avenue of appeal. But the point is, Herb, I don't believe he's guilty. If you'll talk with him, and just tell me what you think, it'll be a great weight off my mind. And my conscience. You take a walk with me over to death row? All right, let's go. Davis was uh, test driving one of his racers. Blew a tire and lost control. Guard! The mechanic who was riding with him was killed. Davis drew five years for manslaughter. Well, it sounds like involuntary manslaughter. How'd they get here in the first place? The court found criminal negligence. Come on, Ron. Ron, this is uh, Herbert Maris. He's an attorney. I persuaded him to come up and have a talk with you. Thank you very much, Warden. Ron? I certainly appreciate you coming to see me, sir. I'm afraid I'm somewhat of a lost cause. The uh, Supreme Court's already turned me down, and the governor, too. Maybe they're overlooking some of the facts. I don't think so, Mr. Maris. That's my trouble. The facts aren't exactly working for me. But you are innocent, of course. I don't know. Two years ago, I knew I was innocent. 
When I testified at my trial, I knew then. What changed your mind? Living on the road. Listen to what goes on in here. Look, you ask any one of those men out there. Oh, those guys are innocent too. All I know is somebody's got to be wrong. Is that all? No, there's this. This is a transcript of my trial, a record of all the appeals. The witnesses in here I knew were lying at my trial. And now they're beginning to make much more sense to me than I do. If we're going to presume you're innocent, then there has to be a reason why these witnesses lied at your trial. I'd like to hear your reason for that. They didn't like me, Mr. Maris. You're asking me to believe that these other convicts disliked you enough to frame you into the chair? I think it was more a reason of getting rid of me, just getting me off their backs. The fact is, I've never been an easy guy to work with, especially around engines. I always work with the very best mechanics, and these men in here just don't care. After all, Herb, you know they don't come to us very highly recommended. And that's how the trouble started? That's it. They didn't care anything about their jobs. They just throw the work out any way they could. I think they got to hate me about the first day I was foreman. And this is enough reason to send you to the chair? Well, you ask any man on death row what's going to happen to him. Not one of them actually believes he's going to the chair. What you're saying is if they don't ever believe they'll really get to the chair themselves, no convict's going to believe that his testimony is putting you into the chair. Well, that's right. I know that's not much of an answer, Mr. Maris. And I could be lying. At least I've got a better reason than anybody else. Well, if you're lying, Davis, you're doing a pretty poor job of it. You said a little while ago you didn't know whether you were innocent or guilty. But you do know, don't you? Of course. I'm innocent, Mr. Maris. I couldn't kill a man in cold blood. What's our next step, Herb? Talk to some people, ask some questions. Starting with Ron and this transcript here. Before I left the prison, I talked to one of the witnesses at Ron Davis's trial. But a man who lied once under oath will still lie. Herb, I hope I'm telling you something you don't already know, but Ron Davis's old man has been trying for two years to grease his kid's way out of the death house. Well, sounds like a normal thing for a father to do. I said grease the way, buy the kid out of the death house. Teddy Davis has had his lawyers working on every politician all the way to the state house, and now it's you. What are you driving at, Lieutenant? Paying you, isn't he? Just having you in the case is going to make the governor think long and hard about denying another stay of execution, and that's what the Davis money is buying. Get your hat, Lieutenant. You need some fresh air, particularly in your thinking. We're going to have a talk with Davis about my fee. Anyway, I'd like to find out what kind of a man he is firsthand. While we're gone, can you have one of your men check the whereabouts of Jerry Hansen? He was the one friendly witness at the Davis trial. I'd like to talk to him. He must have had some reason to be his friend. I know I'm not the first father to say this, gentlemen, but... I must admit, I, I never really understood my son. His interest in automobiles, it's, it's fantastic. Well, I'm sure he was exposed to other interests. Yes, his mother who raised him, she died three years ago. Gave him everything a boy could want, finest schools, travel. He had all the money he could possibly use. Yet all he ever wanted to be was a greaseman. Can I offer you gentlemen something? No, thank you, Mr. Davis. If you'll just answer one more question, please. Anything. How much did you pay Warden Morphy to interest me in your son's case? Warden Morphy? I wouldn't go near him with that kind of a proposition. He'd tear my head off. He as much as told me it was my fault. What's happened to Ron? Let's see. Well, thank you, Mr. Davis. Goodbye. Mr. Davis. Goodbye, gentlemen. Are you sure you won't change your minds and have a spot of refreshment? No, I'm thanks. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Merritt. I'll have to be direct. I'll offer you $100,000 if you'll save Ron's life. I'm not interested, Mr. Davis. 
But you said you were. That's why you came here. I'm interested in developing the facts in your son's case. Well, you're an attorney. Developing facts is your profession. Surely you expect a fee. A fee, yes. A bribe, no. If Ron's innocent, we'll get him off, and you'll get a proper bill for my services. Goodbye, Mr. Davis. Want a drink, honey? Sure, I do. Barrister had enough? Yes, I have. Enough to convince me that Ron Davis deserves a better break than he's been getting. The time it took to drive out and talk to Mr. Davis hadn't been wasted. There was at least one certainty to show for the effort. Teddy Davis was hurting his son's cause more than he was helping it. The money he was throwing around turned most men of goodwill away from Ron. At least the way he was going about it would turn their stomachs. The boys were able to run down your witness, Jerry Hansen. The one who testified for Davis? That's the one. He's selling used cars. Should be on duty right now. Let's go. Take care of the police. You, Jerry Henson. Did I do something wrong? You don't seem to be very anxious to sell cars. Well, is it against the law? I'm just here because the parole officer said I had to have a job. We'd like to talk to you about Ron Davis, Mr. Hanson. Oh, uh, the kid who killed Ace Coleman. Yeah. You say that as though you believed he did. Well, didn't he? At the trial, you testified as to the boy's character. Yeah, I stuck my neck out. Why? Did somebody get to you with the idea that Ron Davis had a rich old man who'd pay a lot of money for that kind of testimony? Oh, no. To tell you the truth, I liked the kid. Some guys were ganging up on him, and the kid didn't have a chance. You know, the way I see it, what he did wasn't so wrong. Yes? Well, somebody had to be on his side. I see. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Hanson. I hope we didn't keep you from your work. Oh, not at all, Mr. Uh, uh... Maris, Herbert Maris. I may be in touch with you again. Why, Mr. Maris? Yes? All right, send them in. Maris, I'm Mr. Richards. Now, this is Mr. Cook. I know you gentlemen by reputation. We're here because we heard you might represent the Ron Davis kid, uh, trying to get him off, I mean. It's possible. You see, we have our own wires in the most of the big prisons, and we happen to know what a, uh, what a louse Ace Coleman really was. And we thought if you could tell us what you're turning up, we might be able to help you all we can. How? Huh. Even if the kid did kill him. We could put down on paper for you some of the things we knew about Coleman, then you could prove that the kid did the state a good thing when he killed him. How's that? Very interesting, gentlemen. I'll call you if I need you. My, uh, my secretary always knows where I am. Miss Benton, cancel all my appointments. I'll be spending the rest of the day with Lieutenant Weston. Counselor, the simple fact is I don't have a day I can give to this. What about Richards and Cook? Two of the biggest hoodlums in town, and they want Ron Davis to burn. They said the same things to me that Hanson said to you and made believe they wanted to help. Obviously, they figured that if I think Ron Davis is guilty, I'll get off the case. Are you just going to ignore that altogether? You tell me what law they broke, and I'll have them picked up. All right, all right. If it isn't too inconvenient, I'd like to see the record and identification packages and all the witnesses in the Davis trial. 
Why do you want that? Well, there must be something in the records of those men that'll tell me why they all lied. Give me the names I'll phone down and authorize it. I'd like to start with Jerry Hansen. Are you forgetting, Counselor, that Jerry Hansen actually did testify for Davis at the trial? And I'm not forgetting that Richards and Cook also spoke for Davis in my office. And they all want him dead. Now I'd like to find out why. How you doing, Counselor? Finding anything? Some interesting facts here, Lieutenant. No, don't hold down. Tell me about them. Fact number one. Hansen was sent up for embezzling $2,000. Barely enough to get him a felony conviction. I also talked to Hansen's parole officer. He's worried about Hansen. Mm. Keeping bad company? Good company. Expensive cars, women, apartment that costs $200 a month. Pretty high living for a used car salesman who makes no attempt to sell. You know, maybe your client, Ron Davis, actually did pay for that testimony. You can be sure I'm going to find out. Hanson should still be at the used car lot. I think I'll run over and have a talk with him. Something you can do for me while I'm gone. Oh. Name it, Counselor. Hanson's record of previous arrests, six of them, three convictions. He had his shots, didn't he? East Coast, West, South, all over the map. Might be a good idea if you teletype those police departments. Ask for a full report on those arrests. This car's not for sale. It belongs to my girl. I was just talking to your parole officer. You got him worried. You're spending too much money for a salesman who doesn't sell anything. This is a job. The law states that a parolee has to have a job. I got a job. Eight hours. The rest of my day belongs to me. You're on parole, Hanson. You don't have any citizen's rights. I want to know where you got that money. Did Davis pay you to testify for him, or did his father? Ask them. Goodbye, Mr. Maris. I've got to get some sleep. Maris is making heat. I don't know why he's picking on me. He just is. The point is, I may have to skip out of my parole. That means clear out of the country. It's going to cost you more money than we figured. Well, don't complain to me. You can afford it. You better make it this afternoon. Find out anything? Nothing to cheer about. What kind of answers are we getting here? I think they prove out my hunch against Hanson. He's strictly a confidence man. Detroit, arrested for selling phony stock. Chicago, picked up on the old pigeon drop swindle. Buffalo, automobile broker, selling other people's cars in consignment and skipping out with the money. On and on it goes. One cute little swindle after another. You receive reports on every major crime committed in the country, don't you? Mm-hmm. Routine reports. They come over the wire. Well, let's get those reports and go down to your statistical department. I have a question or two for that IBM machine. represent all major crimes committed in the six cities on the day Hanson was arrested for Bunko in those cities. Buffalo, homicide, murder weapon, ice pick, no arrest. Chicago, homicide, murder weapon, kitchen knife, no arrest. Detroit, homicide, murder weapon, ice pick, no arrest. The other three cities where he was arrested have no coincidental murders. 
But don't you think three out of six is a pretty fair average? The way I read these, those were contract killings. Do you think Hanson's a paid killer and this con man bit's only a friend? Well, that's his modus operandi. To be sitting in a jail cell on a minor bunco charge while the police are tearing a city apart for a murderer. Yeah, it could work, all right. He fills a contract, kills somebody. Then he makes sure the body isn't discovered for a long enough time so the police can't spot the time of the killing within a couple of hours. After the murder, he gets himself picked up on a minor charge, so he's in jail at the approximate time of the killing, and the cops don't think of tying him up with it. Yeah, Herb, it could work all right. If you get Coleman, all he had to do was turn his modus operandi around. He had to get in prison to kill his victim. Otherwise, the pattern was the same. Yeah, you're right. We'd better talk, pal. Not here. All right. You got my getaway money? No. I've already paid you everything that's coming to you. Oh, wait a minute. You didn't have to do anything. No risks, no discomfort, no prison. Even paid off with Coleman's money. All I ask you to do is to get Maris off my back and you fell flat on your faces. So it's gonna cost you a bundle. We paid you what we agreed the job was worth. What it was... What kind of a bluff is that? It's gonna make a lot of no... No. Richards and Cook. Yeah, know them well. What's your hurry, gentlemen? Get out. Both of you on this side. Hands on the side of the car. Press come. Silencer. Fired recently, too. We better get over to that shed. Sit on these guys. time for you to confess that you killed Ace Coleman. You don't have to kill Ron Davis, too. Tomorrow. <laughs> Counselor, I've never seen it to fail. I've seen a lot of men die, and not one of them ever thought it would happen to him. This time, you, you're wrong, cop. This man knows he's gonna die. Davis didn't kill Tom. I did. You hear enough? Yeah. Let's go. You go ahead. I'll stay here till they pick him up. 